Welcome to an audience with John Kent. My name is Dimitrios Kokokalis. I'm a professor in the School of Tourism. And uh, our Vice Chancellor is going to say a welcome to John and to all of you. Professor John Bean. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture, and uh, particularly uh, because it's in this venue. This is our fantastic new learning facility at Bournemouth University, only been open for a couple of months. So, very pleased to be here to welcome you, and very pleased that it's in this venue. Now, first, a few housekeeping announcements, and I'm hoping John will now say that I missed my calling uh, in the travel and tourism industry. The fire exits are here and here. <laughs> Um, in all seriousness, um, I'm particularly proud uh, to uh, introduce these lectures because I believe that uh, this type of event truly reflects what we're about at Bournemouth University, uh, both in terms of the university and also in terms of the staff. Um, we set out to be challenging, uh, influencing and surprising, and I think today's lecture uh, will be all three of those. Uh, they're open to everyone and uh, they offer a chance to show uh, the Bournemouth University is involved in truly global issues. So I'm particularly proud today to welcome our speaker. Uh, John Kent is one of the foremost entrepreneurs in the travel and tourism industry, and his approach has completely changed the way that we think about holidays and leisure time in general. John is the founder and CEO of utravel.com and the founder of Aquis Hotels and Resorts. He has managed to build uh, both value in terms of his executive role and as an entrepreneur in six major companies, four of which were involved in mergers or acquisitions within the first two years of starting up. He founded MedHotels.com and TravelBargains.com, revolutionising the package holiday model and introducing dynamic packaging for holidays in the UK market. After two very successful years, both companies were acquired by LastMinute.com and John was appointed as the UK Managing Director for the company with global responsibility for the procurement of hotels. Since leaving LastMinute.com, John has continued to generate a range of dynamic projects. He is currently the founder and CEO of online resort accommodation provider, ViewTravel.com, a company that he set up in 2006. He also recently invested in Aquis Hotels and Resorts, uh, which aims to build a portfolio of hotels and resorts in the Mediterranean area. John is a visiting senior fellow at the University of Surrey, a fellow of the UK Institute of Directors, and also a visiting fellow here at Bournemouth University. 2009 saw the opening of the John Kent Institute in Tourism at Bournemouth University. And this is a major initiative in tourism research that was made possible by John's vision. And John has continued to support this internationally significant research activity uh, through to this date. John will be speaking to us today uh, on the topic of tourism innovations. And uh, I'm sure he will be hoping that some of that inspirational, or we'll be hoping that some of that inspirational and entrepreneurial spirit will rub off on us. And uh, I'm sure. Uh, what John has to say will be of great value and uh, extremely interesting and uh, challenging for us all. Uh, please welcome with uh, please welcome me now in uh, uh, saying hello to John and uh, inviting him up to speak to us today. Thank you. Am I moving or I'm here? Thank you, John. Um, the way we've set this up is by engaging in a conversation with John. Uh, partly because John does not enjoy presentation, so every time I, I invite him to do a presentation, he finds a very good excuse to disappear. Um, so I said, this time, John, you would not need the presentation. You will answer any questions that people will have. Um, John and I were try going... At least. <laughs> you, try. Let me actually give you this microphone so people can hear okay. you. I think I'm used to speak very loudly here. Um, and oh, I may use this. Um, John and I were going back for about 15 years on a whole range of different things. Um, and he is one of the most innovative entrepreneurs uh, in the tourism industry around the world. Uh, and hopefully through this conversation, you'll find out a whole range of things uh, back from his experience. Now, over lunch, I managed to 
um, blackmail him a little bit and I said, um, what would you do for a really interesting question? And he said, I'll give the guys a holiday. So um, John has promised that um, he's going to give um, a few days of accommodation in a all week, of actually. how many? A week. A week. In in which hotel? In uh, in Aquisorbas in Crete. In Aquisorbas uh, in Crete, uh, which is a fantastic hotel. I was there in September. Uh, say hello to Nikos when you go, uh, the manager. Uh, and. Uh, for a particular period, subject to availability, Somewhere because it's fully booked. Yeah. So he'll choose at the end of the evening, uh, he'll choose the most interesting question that <coughs> is addressed to him. Um, we would like to have this conversation in a very, very interactive way, and we would like to engage with everybody here. And also you can see that there's a Twitter feed on the background. There's, um, we're operating on Facebook, and there's a live streaming from people around the world that they can actually um, follow the conversation. Now, You've had, the you had an introduction to John, this nice um, three gentlemen here, um, are here to help us with some interesting questions as well. And it's my colleagues, uh, Steve Richards, Derek okay. Robbins, and I'll find the user of suspects. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to win a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> now, something I didn't say is that um, so you, uh, I'll exclude myself from, from the prize, but uh, the panel can be. So um, I'll start with a very. Am I using this one or this yeah. one? This one is for streaming. This one for everybody to hear. So okay. uh, we, we use both. Um, so John, how did it all started? Fifteen years ago, Greek Flight Club. I still remember that. Yes. Yes, I was one of your clients. I was buying tickets on Olympic. Okay. First of all, hello to everybody. Uh, all started in 1994. In, uh, somewhere in Ipswich, in Suffolk. Uh, I had the idea they were of Greek Flight Club. So what was Greek Flight Club? I realized, sorry, yeah. Is that better now, yeah? Uh, I realized that there were 60,000 Greek students in UK, all over the universities in UK. Uh, so internet was in the very, very beginning. Uh, internet exists only in, uh, in, in the labs and universities, nowhere else. Uh, so these guys, they had access, all the students, they had access. And uh, <laughs> I created a company in order to accommodate uh, those 60,000 Greek students to travel. So back once I was in Greece. It was the very first uh, online website. I found the system through US. Uh, and it was bookable online as well. And as far as I remember, I think it was the very first uh, the travel website in the UK. Uh, and that's how it all started really. And the rest is history. Then goes Virgin? No, no, Gemstone Travel. Okay. Which was a calling center and on the teletext days, people will call. Absolutely, yes. People yeah. will, will see on teletext a number and an offer and people will make a phone call. So late 90s, uh, so the major uh, so advertising source for the so call centers and travel agents in UK was teletext. Uh, it was a, a very powerful tool at the time. Uh, and there were many companies, including Gemstone, the one I mentioned. I used to work for Gemstone. Uh, it's the only advertising source we have, so was Teletext. And we used to receive around 5,000 calls a day uh, with a conversion rate of about 20%. Uh, so Teletext, so change, if you want, so through the technology in the early 2000. Uh, but that, that, so that's how we work at the time. Uh, so Gemstone got the award from... Uh, the fastest growing company in UK uh, in the travel industry and number 16 in all industries from uh, the fast track 100, I think if I remember well, 1997 <coughs> and 1998, so two consecutive years. And then you had a meeting with Mr. Branson. Yes. And what did he do to you? So he had me. Uh, I, 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 I didn't know. Uh, so Richard, I, so they approached me from one of his people, one of his directors, uh, while I was in Gemstone, because Gemstone was uh, the number one uh, so client of Virgin Holiday, actually Virgin Sun Holidays. It was a company which was doing Mediterranean at the time. It doesn't exist today. Uh, I had an approach to join Virgin, uh, the family of Virgin, as they call it. Uh, I was quite difficult to them <laughs> for three months. Uh, 
uh, we couldn't and agree. And then they gave you a lot of money. And, uh, and then uh, a, a Friday evening, I remember it was 6 o'clock, May, May 99, I think. <laughs> I had a call and uh, so from Richard, and so he asked me to go to Oxford to his house to meet him for the next day. That's how we changed again. And then after spending some time, ago, some time there before Singapore Airline bought them, I spent I, I spent less than a year. Less than a year. Yeah. Singapore Airline bought them, and you moved on. I think that was before, but anyway, it was a lot of uh, big story there. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I, I introduced my first business actually with one of uh, my colleagues in Virgin. We left Virgin and we started so travel bargains, uh, which was if you want the first step. Uh, of the dynamic packaging. Okay. So Travel Baggage was a traditional call center at the time, uh, so selling all the tour operators, so package holidays uh, over teletext. So Travel Baggage introduced dynamic packaging in the UK for the leisure? Not really, uh, dynamic packaging, but yes, a tailor-made packaging. Tailor -made. So the way you were still using teletext, Yes. To advertise, and then people were calling, and you were bringing flight and accommodation. Yes. So the difference was compared to, if you want, the, so the normal so package holidays at the time that uh, we realized that if we split the three elements of the package holiday, the three elements are flight, hotel, and transfer, uh, and uh, we source the hotel so directly from the hotel instead of the tour operator. We sourced the flight from the operators, like, actually it was the booming of the low-cost carriers at the time as well. Uh, so EasyJet, Ryanair were in the market. So you had uh, three sources to, to get the flights. The one was the scheduled flights, of course. So the other ones was the charter flights from the major tour operators, because they don't sell only packages, they sell flight only as well. And the third one was the low-cost. It was plenty of capacity in the market. And when you have plenty of capacity, plenty of capacity, you have... Uh, so competition, and you, when you have competition, the price, they come down. So we choose the cheapest, if you want flights in the market. We contract hotels directly. We found the transfer, that was the easiest thing. And we tailor made the packets. And that was, in some cases, by 50% or 70% cheaper in the same hotel, so than a traditional package holiday of one of the major tour operators. And that's changed the market, I believe, in the early 2000s. And then you have <coughs> med hotels coming into the game. How did you yes. start with Med Hotels? Med Hotels came out of, of Travel Bargains. Uh, so Travel Bargains with this new model, if you want, was booming. And not only booming, but we didn't have even competition. Nobody else was doing it. And all our competitors in Teletext, they couldn't compete with us because they were buying so ready-made packages, the traditional packages, compared to what I described a minute ago. Uh, so I had an idea and I talked to my partner, which he disagreed with me at the time. And I said to him, we have something unique here. We have some hotels, not many at the time. I think we had two, 300 hotels, uh, so directly contracted. And we have this model. We do extremely well. But what about if we share that with our competitors? He said, are you crazy, John? We are so unique. We make good money. We have a good business. Why do you do that? And I said to him, because maybe we can change the market. And maybe can this, so this can be very big. And I didn't listen to him, to be honest. We did it, and it was extremely successful. Uh, so medhotels.com was a, an amazing story for me. Uh, started in uh, end of 2001 uh, with, uh, I don't know, so 300 hotels. Within a year, we had about 2,000 hotels all over Mediterranean, mainly resort hotels, not mainly, actually, only resort hotels. Uh, <coughs> And uh, we educate the market, we educate the travel agents because mainly it was business to business, B2B. And what we used to do in travel bargains, we had to educate all the other agents. If you take the hotel from us, if you go to the open market to, to get your flights uh, and you put it together, you can do what we'll do in travel bargains. And that was extremely successful. Uh, within a year, we have signed about 7,000 7, agents in UK out of 10. They used to work with us. That's the story of my hotel. Uh, so okay, 2,000. To uh, <coughs> yes. <laughs> to lastminute.com. <laughs> yes, actually. For how much? 
it's better if we don't go to numbers. But uh, <laughs> actually, before lastminute.com, we, we, uh, we had a lot of approaches from uh, so to trade players in the market, like lastminute.com and like and other major uh, operators in UK and in US. Uh, and I decided n to go with with none of them, and we went with Barclays. <laughs> Uh, so the private equity of Barclays, uh, which they got a share in the business uh, in November 03, on the 12th of November 2003. And uh, a day after this completion, on the 30th of November, <laughs> I had a phone call from lastnight.com, which we were talking so for the last three months that I said no to them. So they dubbed their offer, and <laughs> in three weeks, on the 2nd of December 2003, we, we had another completion. So this time, 100% of the business acquired by lastminute.com. And actually, Barclays uh, so got the award uh, of the year for the fastest deal ever in, 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 their, uh, anyway, in their business. They doubled their money in a week's time? No, they tripled their money <laughs> in uh, three weeks' time. In three weeks a time. million a week. Not bad at all. <laughs> yes. And then you went lastminute.com for a while being very heavily involved with the acquisitions and the mergers? Yes, I went to lastminute.com in so December of three until uh, September of five. Okay, and then back to Greece to develop? And then back to Greece, uh, yes, in 2006, actually started going back to Greece. Uh, I developed, uh, so you travel.com at the end of 2006 which was, to be honest, a copy-paste of Met Hotels. So many people, they ask me at the time, why the same again? Because Met Hotels was a monopoly, if you want, in this model in 2002, 2003. But between 2002 and 2006, there were many players in the market. They copy-paste Met Hotels, which was very successful. Uh, so I found in 2006 about four major players in UK, plus another 50 smaller players in, in, in this model. And everybody asked me at the time, why the same, John? And I said, because this one is extremely successful, this model in UK, but uh, it doesn't <coughs> exist in a way in the rest of Europe. Uh, don't ask me why. Till now, actually, it's very small as a model, as a size, everywhere else in Europe except UK. UK is very, is very strong. And, and the main, so if you want, so my answer, my friends was, I will do it again for so two, three reasons. Reason number one, because I know it, I create it. Reason number two, because we have the clients in UK and we can approach them quite easy. And reason number three, because of Europe. And, and that's how so you travel.com came with Barclays again. Barclays approached me and said, let's do it together. And uh, we start that with Barclays. Okay. And then recently you sold um the safe acquired it? Uh, not exactly. Uh, uh, June 2010, uh, myself and, and my partner in, in the other business, we acquired the, 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 the part of Barclays, if you want the business. So Barclays is, uh, is out now. Okay. And then Aquis Hotels and Resorts emerged sometime in 2008. Eight. Eight. Yeah. I remember telling you don't go into hotels, John. I remember that. Many people, they told me that. <laughs> they told me you. Uh, yes, w why in hotels? Actually, the most of the people, when, because I always ask my friends and my colleagues, do you like this idea? The, most of them, they said, no, we don't. But I went, I went for it. Uh, and, 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 and the reason I went for it is because uh, I realized, so having the experience of the online tour operating from you travel and met hotels in all these years, that in Southeast Mediterranean, and if we call Southeast, so Greece, Egypt, so Turkey and Cyprus, uh, the hotels, they haven't, they haven't been consolidated like in uh, West. West is Spain, Portugal, maybe. Spain, for example, which is the number one market by far. Uh, and to give you a number, so for you travel and met hotels in the past, Spain destination was the 44% of the business, and still today, and the rest, so, so the 56 were all the other countries together. Uh, Spain is being consolidated in hotels. I think the number is 61%. Why they did that? 
Well, because so this has happened a lot the last six, seven years. Uh, when they realized that, uh, so Tui and uh, Thompson, they went together in Europe, and uh, Thomas Cook with Neckerman in Germany. Uh, and, you know, so you had, uh, so two giants, if you want. And so the hotels, they had to react, because if you have to fight a small hotelier, an independent hotelier, uh, to a tour operator to the size of Tui or Thomas Cook, it's extremely difficult, believe me. <coughs> Uh, and uh, so they had to react, and the Spanish, they react immediately, and they create a lot of so, chains of hotels in different ways and shapes, if you want. Some of them in ownership, some of them in sales and marketing, only franchise, management, whatever. And now you have many, many hundreds so chains of hotels in Spain. And I realized that, so this is not happening in, in the southeast, mainly in Greece. I started from Greece, I haven't been out of Greece yet. In, in, in Egypt is slightly better, and in, in Egypt actually, not even in Delhi. Uh, and in, in Greece, the consolidation is only 4% compared to 60 in Spain. So I thought, so let's try and do that. A very difficult model, a very difficult uh, so project. Uh, so this is only two and a half years old, you know, in order to get synergies and to consolidate hotels. Right now we run so 13, 14 hotels in Greece with three different uh, so models, franchise, management, long lease, and freeholds. Uh, and that's what I do right So now. that's a nice little history of John's life in the last 15 years. Can I ask you to come on that side of the sofa, John? Yeah. Because our cameraman there would like to have a better that's look better at you. Actually, yes. That's a better profile, he keeps telling me, yeah? <laughs> okay, uh, so fantastic. Now, colleagues, I'll, I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, I'll, ask, I'll start with my colleagues here to ask one question each, and then uh, I'll pass the microphone to anybody around who would like to ask John questions. Who would like to start, guys? The famous salad. Well, as long as you can go first, because that means I've got the first bite of the free holiday, isn't it? Oh, stop it. Um, John, thank you very much for coming. It's always a pleasure to see you, and we all appreciate the support that you give the school and the Broadway University, so very, very nice to see you again. Clearly, you've had uh, sort of exponential sort of success over the past sort of 15 years. If I can just ask a bit of a personal question, what what do you think it is about you as an entrepreneur that has given you the sort of confidence or whatever to, to really have that success? That's the first part. The second part, bearing in mind there's a lot of just students. Go one by here. one. Just go no, by one. No, don't, no. Behave. Um, the, se the second part of the question is to what extent, because I think you, you met Dimitros at the University of Westminster. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So to what extent did a sort of university education help with your entrepreneurial development? So sort of two sides to the question, really. Okay. So the first one, first of all, I was an entrepreneur all my life. I'm only for the last so 10 years, I'd say roughly 11. Uh, I believe that uh, I'm a very hard worker. I work 24-7, and I always used to, to work like that. I believe you must have that if you're an entrepreneur, or at, I think the most of them are. Uh, and uh, you have to believe, I believe, in what I do, even if I take, uh, if I, I take risks. If you don't take risks, you cannot be an entrepreneur, in my opinion. And uh, I believe you have to focus in niche markets, for example, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be an investor in, in many different industries, if you want, or business. Uh, and that's why I focus, and uh, if, if, you, if you see, so the two business I'm running in Clano, so you travel in Aquis, they have many similarities. So you travel has 3,000 hotels, resort hotels, Aquis has resort hotels, they have a very strong commercial relationship between them. And uh, I focus, for example, in resorts only. Many people, they told me, why you don't get involved in city product? In the, in the hotel sector, I said, although we do that a bit now with utravel.com, uh, I said, because this is too wide. Everybody does that. Expedia is another one on that in the world, and, 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 and all the big OTAs of the world. So I prefer to have and to work on a niche market which, uh, you know, we have the expertise and when we know very well. So that's, if you want, that's how I can describe. Uh, and the second one, uh, if you repeat the question regarding education, do you mean my education or uh, all the help from the education at university? Uh, 
about you, your sort of development of this concept of dynamic packaging, that actually yeah. reducing the price and packaging everything. One of the impacts of that has been on consumer protection, and particularly the air travel operator's license and the CAA air travel operator's license, and some confusion, I think it would be fair to say, on who does get covered when they buy a holiday and who doesn't get covered when they pay a holiday which has now led to a fairly big review by the Civil Aviation Authority, although they haven't really got very far with it. I was just wondering what your long-term sort of advice and view is on whether ATOL is a good scheme, whether it should be retained, and whether you see it as having a long-term future. Okay, I'm not the expert on that, although I know many cases and what happened so the last three, four years, and uh, actually, so there were uh, so two big cases which went to court. Yeah. Uh, with Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, so the one was with the biggest uh, so B2C business to consumer uh, online uh, so website in UK. Uh, and the other one was with uh, the biggest uh, so bed bank like you travel. Uh, so both cases they went to, to court, to the high court, actually the last uh, two years. Uh, and it's very confusing, you are absolutely right. And, uh, so the, in the one case uh, uh, with uh, so the bed bank, so bed bank I call a business like you travel, uh, which we offer so hotel and accommodation, etc. CAA won the case, saying that uh, you don't act as a principal because so you have to act. So you travel is acting as a principal. The most of the bed banks in uh, the most of our competitors, if you want, they don't act as a principal. They act as an agent uh, on behalf of the hotelier. And, and now, you know, so this model is changing again in order to protect the consumer more. And uh, although still, so now these days, we, not all the bed banks they have, so they have, uh, so this uh, acting as a, uh, as a principal, as we call it. And the other case was with the, so the biggest, as I said, I will not mention the name, uh, online player in UK right now. And, and uh, CAA, Civil Aviation, lost the case to the High Court. Uh, and, and, and the case was, so, so this uh, agent said, okay, we buy the flight from a low-cost carrier or from a charter airline or from a schedule, they are licensed. We buy the hotel from the hoteliers or from a bed bank like youtravel.com, they are licensed, so the transfer is not a serious element, so why will it come? Because they didn't have, and they don't have till now, uh, a license, and they won't. So it's, but if you ask me, if, if, if I go straight the answer to your question, I believe CAA should be in the model of Germany. What they do in Germany is very, although they are moving that, that, in that direction, uh, they have a very small fee per passenger in, in Germany. Uh, for example, if you have an operator which carries, I don't know, one million passengers, they pay one euro so per passenger, something like that. And Compared to UK, we still now, but please, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, I repeat, and I don't know what's happening in the last year, if you want or so. Uh, it was, uh, so you need a, a strong bond in UK in order to get a CAA license, the ATOL, as you said. And I think CAA is moving to the direction of, uh, I, I think so. And uh, I think it's the right move. Would you include airlines in that bond, though? At the moment, I the airlines know. aren't but the package holidays are, and that's partly where the confusion comes. To be honest, my personal opinion, yes, I would. Yeah. Thank you. So the problem is the airline, it's not the, it's not the holiday. It's, it's if the airline goes bust that people are left out. Yeah, but it's a hotel as well because of health, uh, of health and safety issues. It's not only airlines. It's what I mentioned before regarding the acting as principal or acting as agent. But the major issue is repatriation, isn't it? It's bringing people back. The major issue, yes. So it's, it's mm -hmm. primarily it's transportation rather than... Although if somebody goes bust, you're also covered for the price you've paid in advance. Right. So you get the refund. You get a refund. Okay. Hi, I'd like to ask about your 
your uh, experience, your offer your hotels. I went on your website and you got a uh, not tomato, a composer yep. for different experiences. Yep. If you can talk us through the rationale behind it and how you create experiences across all the hotels. Impossible. That's a long answer. Actually, I, I think Dimitros will be the best one to answer that. He was involved on that project. Well, that was 1991, though, wasn't it? That was the question I missed because I was trying to find another microphone. Regarding Sorry. the composer in Apple's website. You create lots of other sub experiences on the website. For the on the in Apple's. Well, uh, for the people, okay. I'm also on the. Let me get the microphone first. Um, John has been um, um, kind enough to include me in the board of Apple's. And when Apple's started, we looked into how Aquis can actually differentiate its product and provide a new uh, offering in the marketplace that will be different, fresh, and focused on the value. And when we looked into the, in, when we looked into the product, we identified several exp seven experiences. And the experience were love, meet, play, pamper, taste, and things like that. And one of the things that um, you, you can see on the website of Aquis is that there's a filter which, depending on the facilities of the hotel and the services of the hotel, it filters the hotels according to that. So <coughs> if, you, if, you go into meet, if you go into meet, which is about meetings, conference incentives, the mice market, um, and you say, this is my main concern, meeting, it filters out of the 14 hotels, it goes down to three. So the idea was to map the user requirements and the market expectations to the services and the offers that we can that we can offer, some of the hotels are adults only, uh, 18 years old um, uh, and more. And these will, will these hotels w had a very different experience than some of the other hotels that they had um, uh, water, um, uh, big swimming pools and water parks and things like that. So it was really about bringing the value to the customer and differentiate the whole market according to that, and creating some extra little services that we could offer as a company. Thank you, Dimitri. Has it worked? Okay. Thank you. Has it worked, the experience? Definitely, yes. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was a real, it was how you differentiate. And this, these seven experiences are, are quite distinct in things. <coughs> so do we take some questions from the Twitter feed? Um, I can see um, with the growth of online packaging, um, is, is the travel agent dead? Sorry, Mr. can you repeat, please? Is with the, the online packaging and the online business, are travel agents going to die? Yes. <laughs> so the traditional <laughs> travel agents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just Next to give you a number, I don't have the exact number, but in, in, in UK and Germany, uh, seven, eight years ago, you had, I think, between so 12 and 14,000 agents in each country. Now oh. they're about a half and they are on the way down. Okay, and is this why you travel is now going to business to consumers? Would you like to say something about you travel going? Yeah, not okay, so about so two weeks ago, uh, we launched uh, youtravel.com again as a consumer face this time, and we recreate uh, you travel, the old youtravel.com to youhotels.com, we rebranded as well. And now youhotels.com is our B2B arm, which is the main arm. And the, and the new youtravel.com website is, the, is, is a dynamic packaging, uh, so B2C website. Uh, so this has happened only two weeks ago. Uh, many people, they told me, why you do that when main, so mainly you are a trade player? And I said, because all my, uh, so all my competitors, they do it. So if, if they all do it, we will do it as well. And, uh, and that's why we went to B2C. Okay, and what percentage of the of the income of you travel is based on uh, travel agents right now? Until now, until now, okay, because we had a small B2C even before the change, it was 95.5. Okay. Uh, and we cannot, you know, we cannot comment what's gonna happen the next year because it's too new, it's only two weeks old. What is the size of you travel right now? How many packs? Can uh, you say? Some, yeah, I can. It's something under 800,000 a year. 800,000? Yeah. And income, revenue? Can you say? Many questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Who would like to? Uh, Sorry, another question? I'll let you change your mind. Who would like to ask questions for John? Yeah. 
Okay, I'll probably do the microphone goer as well because you need both microphones. Yeah, you yes. can go. You need <laughs> okay then. Okay, uh, with EasyJet starting up their holidays, so we now have EasyJet holidays that was launched last week. Do you see this as competition, first of all, for companies like your own? And as a second part, do you see that they could become the new tour operators uh, compared to TUI or Thomas Cook? So that they're LTC driven, basically. Can you repeat the first part, please? Yeah. Yes. Um, EasyJet Holidays, which launched the, the, the holiday company last week, do you see that as any competition to companies like your own because they're actually driven by the LCCs themselves? Do you see that will be competition to uh, two companies like yours? Which Th company? You travel or? You Mexico? travel, yeah. You travel. Mm. Yeah, first of all, everybody believing in the market right now will compete with each other, either if you call it EasyJet or not. Uh, with EasyJet through the main supplier, actually the one you mentioned, uh, because they have a main partner which they work with uh, as the provider of the holidays in the new s section. We are one of the feeders on the of the supplier, so we are going to work with EasyJet holidays. Okay, that's good. It's indirect. Uh, Everybody feeds each other? <laughs> kind of, yes. Um, it's a I'm very open market. In uh, UK, in UK, not in Europe yet. And the second part was, do you think companies like yours or um, like EasyJet Holidays will become the new tour operators, if you like, that they will take over from TUI and Thomas Cook eventually? I, in the I think they will not become. They are already. I think they will not become tour operators. Yeah. They are already. <laughs> and uh, if you see so the trend of, uh, of, the, of the traditional tour operators, like the ones you mentioned, uh, you will see that uh, the last uh, six, seven years after the Met Hotels model, I call it Met Hotels model, this one, as so Met Hotels was the first one, uh, they acquired so business like uh, so Met Hotels. For example, Met Hotels now, although uh, it's been acquired by lastminute.com when I was there, today belongs to Thomas Cook. So it's been, so Thomas Cook uh, acquired from lastminute.com. And, and TUI has another one, uh, Hotel Beds. Uh, everybody has one now. Uh, so you can see that even the traditionals, they believe in that model and they are moving towards this direction, although it's going to take them years because, you know, it's too bureaucratic if you want. They are too big and it's not very easy to transform from the one year to the other. You're welcome. John, you keep talking about UK. My friend here would like to ask you about Germany. Yes? Yes, he would like to ask you about Germany, yeah? Is Germany the biggest market and still doesn't go online? This is what you want to ask, but you were afraid to, yeah? <laughs> I'm very good at this game. <laughs> yes, Germany is the biggest market. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, an opportunity, if you want, of utravel.com now is to go to Germany. And that's what I'm trying for the last two years. It's a very fragmented market. Uh, he has, they have four big players. Uh, compared to two in UK, UK we have two and Thomas Cook. In Germany they are two Thomas Cook, Reve Group, and uh, Altours. So the fourth one, the only private one actually. Uh, it's uh, and the online uh, model in Germany is less than 10 percent. Uh, and I believe it's a, you know, it's a. I think it's the next is the next big one to come. Uh, it's coming actually. I can see it. Uh, th there are not many players in our model like we do, or like we do in UK, all of us here in Germany. And I believe they have all the flights because it's important in order to work this model, you have to have a lot of flight capacity in low cost charter and schedule. They have that. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a matter of time. I think it's not far at all. Within one, two years, you, we will see a booming in dynamic packaging in Germany. Um, nope. When I finish my master's, my intention is to follow in your entrepreneurial footsteps and start my own company. Good luck. If you could give me one tip, what would you, what piece of advice could you give me? So don't go on holidays for 15 years like I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. John, on that topic, where do you go on holiday? Do you ever go on holiday? Sometimes, yes. Where do you go? At when I was, uh, when you described my career earlier on, I didn't. I had only a few weekends. 
but now yes I do. Am I allowed to say that your last holiday was in Rhodes and the fact that you took another room that you established a hotel in the hotel, you took another room and you built a, an office there and you spent most of the time on the other room? Yes, that's right. <laughs> I was allowed to say that. Okay, Nina. Sorry, it's a little bit awkward, but one thing is for the streaming and the other for the... Right, John, can, is this right? Can people, oh, I'm very interested in your, the, your online model in the UK, as you say, and you're obviously becoming very powerful in terms of market share and so on. I'm wondering where you see the market going. Do you see that the intermediaries, as I would say you are, uh, are going to become dominant rather than, say, the consumer now or the supply side as it used to be? I tell you what I can see. I can see that in, uh, let's say, seven, eight years, you will have big hotel chains, which they will do dynamic packaging themselves. And they will cut all the tour operators in between, like you travel or like anybody else. That's what I can see. So the hoteliers will um, so source no hotel. Um, yes. airline tickets, and they'll provide the whole package for you. Yes, correct. Yeah? And in that case, you will cut between one and three in the middle. So the all-inclusive becomes really utterly super all-inclusive from door to door. Yes, if you talk about all-inclusive, yes. So this is news, isn't it? That's the vision of John. Super all-inclusive from door to door. Everybody on the channel. And that's interesting because what we see from research is that everybody is becoming intermediary and everybody no matter where they are on the value chain, they are becoming intermediary and they are playing a whole range of roles that typically before they were kind of silos between different players. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, before I pass uh, the, the, the question to Nicholas, John, would you like to say what's happening in the Mediterranean uh, right now with in regards with Egypt and Tunisia and the different places? Um, wh how do you see 2011 summer? Okay. Uh, okay. Of course, Egypt had a lot of effect, if you want, in many, in many other countries. Uh, Egypt is coming back from UK. Uh, we can see that in your travel. We see a lot of Egypt in your travel. And to be honest, even during the so the two weeks of the of the heat there, we had bookings to Egypt. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, so from UK, not many. For example, we used to have, we used to get so 300 bookings a day in the good days before, and we went down to 20. But there were people that were going there. The problem is, and I was explaining to Dimitri earlier on today, that although in UK the most of the tour operators they carry on their programs to Egypt, maybe smaller, maybe they reduce a bit of capacity, but they go. And especially in the summer, probably they will have probably full capacity as well. Uh, so this is not happening from uh, other countries like France and Germany, they are big markets. And you can see that all this uh, so volume, I think Egypt is around 11 million, Dimitri? Something like that, incoming. Uh, a, a, big, a, a big chunk of that will go to, will be split between Spain, it's the biggest one, and have they have a lot of capacity, Greece, yes. uh, Portugal, Cyprus, actually that's it. So the reason I didn't mention Turkey, because Turkey is full already. It's, uh, or if not full, you know what I mean. It's, 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 it's a they have an amazing growth so the last seven, eight years. Uh, so I can see, I can see a, a, a big plus year on year in Spain and Greece, which are mainly so big markets if you want. I can see Greece, for example, over 10%. And, and Greece so suffered the last two years. And I think we're going to have so 10 plus. Uh, yes. Uh, so that's what is happening in the Mediterranean. Okay. Nicholas, um, I wanted to touch upon just what you said before, that uh, hotels actually might become start their own tour operators. In that regard, do you think um, or do you see that social media could become a relevant distribution channel as opposed to just feeding the inspiration? <coughs> of course. So social media is already a kind of distribution channel for hotels. And, uh, absolutely, yes. 
Do you have to say about TripAdvisor and what you do in Nakwis with TripAdvisor and how you take forward uh, consumer views? Yeah. Well, okay, first of all, it's not only TripAdvisor. To be fair to, to the competitors of TripAdvisor, <laughs> so there are three big players in, uh, in, in Europe. So TripAdvisor is the, is the one you know in UK mainly and US. Uh, for example, the, so the Germans, they use holiday check, so 80% of the Germans, they use holiday check for reviews. And uh, so Central Europe, France, Belgium, Holland, and Poland, I think, they, they use Zuver. Uh, so these are the three big ones, if you want, in, uh, in, in Europe. And so what we try to do in Aquis uh, from day one is we try to reply to every review, <coughs> actually every... Some of them in the very good ones as well, but, but definitely in, in our bad ones or in the, in the ones they had a small complaint, but in general they were happy. Uh, we have a team in Aquis which the only thing they do is to reply to reviews and to explain why that was wrong in the hotel or why that, how can improve that and this thing is going to be better next year, etc., etc. So we pay a lot of attention to review sites. Yeah, can I change tax slightly, John? Could you give a little bit of background to the business model of all-inclusive resorts? Uh, just thinking at the moment of fuel prices, the rising cost of food and what have you. You know, the margins must be quite tight. So a little bit of background to the business model generally and maybe some insights into how it works in different countries in, in the sort of good, the bad, the ugly. Okay, sure. All-inclusive started in the Caribbean. Yeah. In very big uh, resorts, when I say big, for example, five, six, seven restaurants, it's, uh, you know, a lot of facilities, etc. And, uh, and, if, uh, and if, if you ask me now what is the real all-inclusive, I will say to you the real all-inclusive is only in Caribbean, it's not in Europe. In, in Europe, the only, so the all-inclusive, if you want, so became a trend and copied, if you want, so Caribbean, the late 90s. I was involved in that, uh, in that change, if you want. I convinced many hoteliers in the Mediterranean which they didn't want to hear the word all-inclusive, to swap to all-inclusive. And I achieved the most of them. Uh, and the reason was because of the, uh, the cost-saving, if you want, of the consumer, maybe. So they knew what they're going to spend in, in the resort. Although it's a big difference between the European all-inclusive, if we call it European, and the, and the Caribbean all-inclusive. In Caribbean, you will have absolutely everything in an all-inclusive, even a jet ski, let's say, or whatever you can think about. In, in Europe, in the most of the hotels, it's not like that. All-inclusive, we call uh, a full board, uh, if you want, uh, a, 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 a full board model. So all food uh, in the hotel, plus all drinks. Mainly, I'm not saying these are the only ones, but mainly, all-inclusive in Europe means that which is from 10 o'clock in the morning until 11 at night or 12 at night. You can have food and drink as much as you like. In Caribbean, it's 24 seven. You have extra facilities. You have a lot of uh, add-ons, if you want. Uh, now, there are hotel companies in Europe, which they have improved that model, which is only FMB, to something better, so than that. Uh, but they are minor. So 90% of the hotels in Europe, they run on the FMB or inclusive, if we call it like that. Can I ask, do you see any potential for that type of model in the UK? Okay, obviously very, very different, but is there any sort of hope for that yes. type of product here? Definitely. For example, in your, in your town here. Uh, I don't think it exists an inclusive hotel in the UK. And some of the hotels in, uh, in the resort, if you want, in the resorts of, of UK, I believe that some hotels they are suffering and uh, they have low occupancies, especially the, the most of the year. And I think it could be, could work, or at least somebody can try and take the risk. Uh, and, and to transform a hotel in the UK in an all-inclusive. And if the hotel is, uh, uh, if you want, is a small hotel with not a lot of facilities, etc., they can combine it with a local restaurant or with a local uh, bar or whatever. It can be a combination. Uh, a new model of all-inclusive, which is going to include a hotel, a restaurant, and a bar or something. I think it would work, if you ask me. Okay. Just a final question from me. Uh, Greece clearly has a number of challenging issues economically at the moment, and politically, I guess. How difficult is it operating your type of businesses in Greece at the moment? Very. Uh, <laughs> to, to 
Leonis Sovris has uh, so had a lot of bureaucratic issues even before the crisis. And it was very difficult for uh, an investor uh, or, or a foreign company to come and invest in Greece. And that's why, unfortunately for my country, we didn't have a lot of, uh, a lot of investments in Greece. I repeat, even before the crisis. Uh, I was talking to a potential investor in Greece last week in London. Uh, and so they were thinking to, to invest in Greece in a big scale. So recently now, because of Greece uh, and the government announced so privatization of many, of many <coughs> areas in Greece. And, um, and he was telling me that he was, if he can get so tax stability from the government, then he will do it. And hopefully, so this government is working towards the right direction now. Although it's a very difficult time. So for everybody in Greece, for every business, for every, everybody, absolutely everybody. But I believe, uh, I think we're going to suffer for the next five years in Greece, but I think uh, we are moving to the right direction. On the other hand, I can tell you that we are very happy in Greece these days, at least in our industry, because of the growth I mentioned earlier on. Maybe we will like a bit as well with Egypt, etc. And, uh, you know, if you think that the 18.3% of the GDP of this is tourism, is the number one, so number two is sitting with 15, I think we're going to see at least some smiles this summer. That's um, something to report as a news. John Ken is expecting some smiles in Greece this summer. <laughs> John, can I just ask your opinion from the hotel as a hotelier? towards environmental accreditation schemes and sort of greenhouse gas and things like Green Globe, GDTS in the UK, these types of systems, are they valuable to you? Do they help you as an operator of a hotel? Do they help you in a marketing point of view? Are you a member of any of them? First of all, I'm not an expert on that to give the, so the, so the proper answers. Well, although we are moving towards this direction, I have, we have experts in the company. Uh, we are working on that direction. So, so you're looking to get accreditation? Yes. I think we have some already. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know which one. That's good. Primary safety and um, food safety and things like that. You've got to so buy new place. Yeah. Yeah. You have a question? Yes, basically, by the way, we're running on the development. Are you select your destination for new hotel? And are you still bringing funding from the Middle East to help fund your uh, expansion program? <laughs> what was the question? So I could have funding for future development. Okay. Work on progress. Karen had a question here. Hey, John. Hello. <laughs> um, we had the very good fortune to spend a wonderful week at the Aquis Pelicas in Corfu last year. I must compliment you totally on your um, customer service because the people in the hotel were absolutely excellent. So what's the secret of your staff management training program? Or is it Demetrius? <laughs> it's a mix of Demetrius <laughs> and good training. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, anyway. Pelicans, you said, yeah? Have you written a trip advisor report? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, I want to return to something you mentioned earlier. I think you said that your study had been in psychology. Yes. Um, I'm interested in terms of when you want to set out on the route to business success, do you think it's more important to have a thorough grounding in the sector and research the area you want to know about, or do you think it's more important to remain a diligent student of human nature? First one. Subject is expertise. Yes. So you'd like to employ some of our fantastically expert graduates who are graduating from the tourism and the hospitality degrees we do. Why not? Thank you. See these guys this way, yeah? <laughs> so um, there are several students here uh, who would be interested, John. How would someone um, work for you? What, what's the, can they send you a CV or what they need to do for you travel and acquis? Uh, we have an HR department. HR at artisofjobs.com, HR at utravel.com, and we evaluate from there. And you'll welcome Bournemouth University graduates, yeah? Always. Always, thank you. Good afternoon, John. Uh, my name is Adrian Fisher. I'm 
we've been building bases all around the world for the last uh, 32 years, some 600 now. Um, I'm very excited about the idea that you take a holiday because of what you do when you get there. Um, I appreciate most of the money is in when you're unconscious lying in a nice bed somewhere or half unconscious sitting in an aeroplane. But I, I, I have a feeling that what matters is the content and the experience of what you do in the daytime and the kind of enabling experiences that you can do and the way that the industry um, on our side, the designers and uh, suppliers and experiences, we need to make the experience very fulfilling in terms of family holidays, um, exciting experiences, not necessarily white knuckle water rides down gorges all the time, but doing things with families, doing it with friends, and creating really stimulating cultural and family experiences. Uh, how strongly should tourism in the future focus on the content and the experience, uh, rather than necessarily worry too much about the price and the quality? I mean, we've almost taken for granted that there's safety and travel and journeys and accommodation, but you know, it's, it's the experience. Um, how, how can we be differentiated in the future in promoting tourism, both inwardly into Britain as well as outwardly um, in foreign borders? No, our, our main show marketing uh, message in Argos is experiences. Uh, and we try to have different experiences, depends on the hotel, and because you mentioned families many times, of course for families, but not only for families. You know, you can have experience for an adult only hotel or uh, uh, a special hotel to uh, a spe specific uh, show market. Uh, for us, it's extremely important, and that's how we build our, our marketing campaign and our, uh, our, our programs in the hotels, in, in experiences. Uh, and I believe the future is there. Uh, because, okay, everybody is suffering, if you want at least, uh, in, in the resort, so sun and uh, nice beach and, 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 and a nice room. But that's not enough anymore. And so year on year, you will see uh, that uh, experience is very important. Very, very. Perfect. Uh, hello, John. Hello. Uh, I'm Mona. I come from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I have a question about franchise business. So do you think that uh, franchise business uh, can be the best uh, solution for improving uh, tourism industry, especially in uh, developing countries? Yes, definitely. Uh, and what kind of uh, tourism business can be franchised? Are you talking in general about the tourism business, n not the hotels? <laughs> in general. Okay, for the hotels, it definitely works for many companies, not, you know, I'm not talking about our company now, I'm talking in general. Uh, so the franchise model in the hotel industry is working, so for the last so 20 years, let's say. And there are big hotel chains in Europe, which they have a lot of franchise hotels. Uh, now in the, um, in the tourism sector in general, you have a kind of franchise, for example, in UK in the, in the travel agencies uh, uh, so sector. So there are so three, four, I think, so big so travel agencies in UK, which they have like an umbrella, and they give the licenses we were talking before from CAA, et cetera, uh, to smaller so travel agencies in order all the travel agencies to, to have all, so all the small ones to have the coverage that you want they need from CAA. This kind of franchise works. I cannot think of another one now. But in, in general, I think, yes. So franchise is working in the travel industry. Hi, John. Uh, Philip Hello. Alford, um, colleague of Demetrius is in the School of Tourism, also running the Digital Hub project here at the university, which is really focusing on being relevant for business and being outward facing to the business community. So my question, you're obviously very involved with universities both here in Surrey and heading up the uh, institute here. Um, can I ask you, what, what do you see is, how, how can universities be relevant to industry? What um, are the ingredients of good tourism courses and departments? Sorry, I cannot hear you very well. So what are, what are the ingredients of good tourism courses and schools to, to stay relevant to people like yourself in industry? I think you should ask the guys which they are near <laughs> here to answer that. Well, I think I'm, I'm asking you from a bit, you know, you speaking as a business, so as an entrepreneur. What you need, basically, from mm. us, John, is outreach. Good researches, you know, in, in various, uh, in, 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 in various, for, for example, on e-tourism, like, for example, Dimitris does, and I know what he does, or uh, I was talking to somebody earlier on, so regarding social media in, and the, uh, the effect of social media in, uh, in the travel sector. 
you know, definitely we have to take, you know, I, I believe it's, uh, it's very important for us. Thank you. John, how interested are you in, if at all interested, into tapping into the emerging markets of Brazil, Russia, India, and China? And if you are interested, um, do you see a need to modify your existing offer or will one size fit all? Okay, first of all, I'm not interested. Uh, I'll explain you why, though. And, and actually, uh, you give me the opportunity now to explain the difference because many people, they don't understand the difference between utravel.com model, if we call it like that, or Met Hotels model or whatever, dynamic package and resort hotels, and uh, a big OTA, a big, um, oh, uh, when we say OTA, if somebody doesn't, Expedia, Priceline, Booking.com, etc., all the big American boys, as we call them. It's a big difference between these two models because all of them, all of us, we are online. The main difference is that uh, the big OTAs and lastminute.com, yeah, uh, they sell everything. Yeah, they sell, for example, lastminute.com, we used to sell from theater tickets to concert tickets to flights to hotels to packages to whatever. Uh, our model specializes in resorts, first of all, hotels, compared to city hotels. Uh, which the main, uh, so the main OTAs, the big ones, they specialize. And I give you an example which happened a month ago. Dimitris was there in a conference in Athens. It was a guy from Expedia, the, uh, a VP of Expedia. So talking before, I was after him. And, uh, and, and he said to the audience in Greece, in Athens, that, so you know, guys, Expedia is 200% uh, up. I don't remember. Dimitris might remember the number. Uh, year on year in, in Greece. And because Greece mainly is resort hotels, okay, we have, of course, Athens and Thessaloniki, and, but the majority by far it's, uh, are resorts. Uh, so, when I, so when it was my time, I, 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 I said to him, yeah, it's well done, you have a 200% growth, but in general, all the big OTAs, they are not strong in resorts yet. I think they will be, but right now they are not strong. I'm not, they are selling resorts. For example, if you go to any of them, you will find Mallorca, Crete, uh, so Tenerife, Antalya, whatever. If you compare prices to their sites and you compare prices to our model, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying you travel only, oh, oh, so all our players in our model, you will see that in a big, in the 50% of the hotels, which will be similar, you will see a big difference in price and our model is going to be much cheaper than Expedia. Sorry, I don't want to mention any Expedia, yeah? Because they always focus in cities. So recently, so the last three, four years, they add resorts. But because they treat resorts, this is very commercial now, but, but just to give you a, a sort. Because they treat city, city uh, resort product like the city product, in my opinion, they are not successful yet. None of them. Uh, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons, for example, to go to U.S., the U.S. is mainly dominant from these guys. You cannot fight them, or I cannot, you know. Uh, so you need strong marketing fees and uh, amazing numbers in order to, to compete with these guys. So on the other hand, they don't have what we have, or they don't have it in a, they are not that strong in what we have. That's my answer. Okay. Hi, John. Hello. Um, I'm a... Graduate, uh, undergraduate here at Bournemouth. Uh, what I want to know is if you've had any failures or mis uh, made any mistakes, and what did you learn from those ventures? Everybody has failures. Of course, I had. Uh, and always you learn from your failures. You know, <laughs> I believe you cannot do the same mistake twice. Uh, and of course, I had. And you know, I had I had so wrong decisions many times in my business. And uh, and you always learn from those. You know, I cannot tell you what I learned, but I definitely learned. Anything that you really regret it? Everything is major failure, Dimitri. When is a failure? I mean, what, what John says on his email is that the journey is, a, is your world. Yes. It's your world. Sure. Yeah, hi. Um, Hello. I've got a question about resort marketing. Um, and uh, the question is, um, how do you market a resort 
in a new part of the Mediterranean that uh, is not very well known and you don't have very much money to do it. So specifically, uh, I am marketing a, a new resort in northern Cyprus and uh, we have a marina, we have I've got a five-star hotel, beach clubs, so on and so forth. What would be your advice to um, me to kind of promote that and other uh, kind of people who are looking at new new resorts, new hotels in difficult areas? When, when you are talking about the resort, okay, I realize you're talking about the resort hotel. Yes, but yeah, not, n n not a resort as the resort of North Cyprus. Okay, the first thing which I think, and if we are taking the specific example, I think Northern Cyprus year on year has a good growth now, compared to seven, eight years ago. Uh, I believe, you know, as a hotel, if, if, if I talk to you regarding your, so I regarding the hotel, so they are specific uh, if you want, uh, like we talked before about experience, etc. But I believe the major, uh, the major uh, issue here is not how you will promote your resort hotel, but how they promote the resort on its own. Because even if you have the best hotel in the world, if the promotion is not there for the resort itself, and you cannot do a lot of things. Yeah. That's the problem, the fly. The fly is the problem, you know. And I give you, I, I, I give you, uh, I give you some examples on that. Uh, if you don't have a lot of flight capacity to a destination, for example, if I was the, bo the if you want, so the chairman of the tourism, uh, uh, whatever, uh, of, of Northern Cyprus, the first thing I will try to do uh, is to try to get low-cost carriers and charters to come to my destination. Because if you don't have that, you will not be able to succeed if you have, even if you have the best hotel in the world. It's impossible. You need the transportation first. And this is something, unfortunately, is not up to you or you know what I mean. It's, it's up to the, to the government and to the, and to the, and the tourism body there to, to, to work on that. And that's why if I turn it around, our model, so you travel model, doesn't work in countries uh, which they don't have a lot of low-cost carrier capacity and charter. And you give me now the example to give you a failure of your travel, because Dimitri asked me, somebody who asked me before, we, we try in 2007 to open Italy. We open an office in Milan, and we try to establish there. I've seen an opportunity, Italy is going to work. Italy is very close to Spain, Greece, to many destinations. Some of them, they will go by car or by ferry, etc. Big failure. Why? Because the... And Italy is a big market, yes? It's not. Uh, so, the few reasons. So, reason number one, not a lot of low cost to resort destination. A lot of low cost to go from Luton to Rimini, for example, you can go. So, I think it's daily as well. But to go from Rimini to, or to from Roma to Tenerife to Mallorca to Crete, etc., not a lot, very few. So, point number two, the tour operators. So they are working with very old IT systems. So the systems we had in UK in the 60s, they have today in Italy, unfortunately. Even the big ones. So if you are a travel agent in Italy these days, you will not be able to find all the flights. Some of them you will. In, in a system like you can find in UK. From you go to a system and you can see, I can find this is at that price, Ryanair that price. So do we fly that price? In Italy, the travel agent, if they have a customer in front, in front of them, they have to make 20 phone calls. 20 phone calls. How much is the flight on that day to go to Mallorca? There are some, I repeat, in the internet, but not all of them. So they don't have the systems and they don't have the low cost in order, a model like, so you travel to work. It's impossible. Uh, that's my answer. Sorry, I couldn't help more. I'm a final year marketing student and my question is, as the online travel market continues to widen customer choice, how do you think this has affected consumer power and how are you reacting to this? 
How is affecting what? In the market. Sorry, you have to repeat the whole question. Sorry, I'm not with you. No problem. As the online travel market continues to widen customer choice, how do you think this has affected consumers' power in the market, and how are you reacting to this? Hmm. Social media is the answer. Social media. I think so, yes. And based on the new consumer power, uh, John, do you take measures to actually address of the consumer in a different way? Of course, of course. But uh, if, 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 for example, you, so you take this subject and to, and to analyze it, you will see that everything, okay, when we say social media, I don't mean only Facebook, etc. But in general, so all the interactive uh, uh, so sites which you can, I, I believe the, the, that's the only way. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, you're personal entrepreneur. You you yes, Dr. Dave Richards uh, with the business school. Hello. Um, your personal entrepreneurship has obviously been extremely important in the successful organizations you've created. But to what extent do you also feel it's important to create a culture of entrepreneurship within the organizations you work with? A culture. Culture, uh, attitudes, beliefs, uh, mindset of the uh, people who work with you or for you. It's very important. And uh, I can tell you that so till now I have some people so working with me in various so positions, director positions, so etc., which we are together for the last six, seven, eight companies. You know, the, how I describe my business so career, if you want earlier on. I have people which we were together from 1997, and we move company by company. Uh, I count a lot of that, and, 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 and especially the people that work very close to me. And what are the characteristics? What is driving each of them with you? What, what, is the, what's the thing that you are looking into these people? Well, it depends. It, uh, they are very, you know, depends on the position. Couple of things that you appreciate, really? It's a big workaholic. I appreciate that a lot. But not only, yeah, don't take me wrong. I mean, uh, hello. Um, my name is Elias, uh, student of uh, University of Wales, doing MA Hospitality and Tourism. Uh, a question I'm working in a field as well at the same time in London as a travel consultant. Uh, going back to the, um, uh, the debate uh, you said about the travel agents, I'm not saying that you did personally to me, I was saying that like, they are vanishing from the market. Uh, uh, somehow I disagree in a way uh, because of uh, it's a communication barrier because personally what I have seen in the market uh, because doing online not everybody feels really secure uh, booking their holidays online uh, yes it is becoming common now and due to the technology it's becoming very common and available to everybody but still people feel it's a communication barrier and on the other hand there is a, a financial issue uh, attached to it as an after agents uh, members uh, we get deposits from the customers and then they're paying installments uh, because of the economical crisis they cannot pay all in one because if we talk about entire packaging it's to do with the uh, flights accommodation transportation all inclusive so they can't pay all in one go so I think travel agents will be still there in the market and they that they are giving uh, I think enormous percentage to tour operators at the same time I mean, that was my uh, uh, no, opinion, no, that's, you can that's say. The final thing, sorry, to which I wanted to point out was that do you really think that the uh, current economic crisis uh, will really, and the high increase in taxation um, on the airline? Will I will forget your first question, though. Can, can I answer to you that? Yeah. And then we go to the second one, yeah? So, first of all, I didn't say that all the agents, they will go, you know, and you will have only online. Of course, you will have because they are. Uh, s something we have to differentiate is the mass market holidays, which is the 80%, and the 20%, which is more specialists. Yeah? In the specialist holidays, I believe we will stay as it works today with the travel agents, the personal service, etc. In the mass market, which is the 80%, most of them they will go online, but not only online. What I said is the small travel agents, which the most of them they belong to the major tour operators. V v very few are independent so these days. These ones they will go. You have travel agents which they have big call centers and you have the personal service over the phone, of course, not face to face. And you can ask any question you have. 
Regarding the payment, what you mentioned, you, you have that already with the online players as well. Where you don't have it is the big OTAs I mentioned before. There you don't have that. But in the dynamic packaging model which we work, all the online travel agents in UK, they work exactly the same like the traditional travel agent. Eight weeks outside window of your, um, when you book a holiday, you give a deposit. Within, a week, uh, within the eight weeks window, you pay the full amount. That's exactly the same online or not. You're welcome. Did you find the one, sorry, the, uh, uh, do you think the, with the current uh, economic crisis in high taxation that they have implemented on the uh, airport taxes I'm talking about, will that affect the, um, uh, you know, the holidays in future or the packaging people traveling in future, you think? Are you talking about UK, yes? No. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because I believe uh, that uh, so countries like uh, UK, Germany, Scandinavia, Northern Europe, the holiday is a must for the families in, in, this, in these countries. It's a very different approach for uh, an Italian or a Spanish or a Greek to go on holiday compared to a, a, a British person or a German, yeah? Because you don't have the sun here or you don't have a lot of sun. And, and the holidays, uh, it's, 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 part, it's part of our life here. And, and I, I believe we had an average of two and a half holidays a year per family or something. Now it's a bit down to two because of the crisis, et cetera. But no, you will not, you know, always, you know, people mourning when you, you have a change in the taxis or in the airline. But uh, so holiday for the British, in my opinion, for the British consumer is like, it's if, if, if you say to a British, you don't go on holidays, like to say, don't go to the supermarket. It's impossible. Thank we'll you. not change that. So totally inelastic. Yeah. Hi, uh, I have a three-part question. Um, three-part question. Okay. Yeah, I will one do by gradually, one, one by one. Um, the first one: What are the key differentiators of your company to the ones that you mentioned before that they are not the same as yours? Sorry, which ones? You mentioned the big OTAs. I mentioned the American boys, or I mean. In general, you, you said Expedia is different to your company. What, yes. is the what is the difference between the two? I explained it before. In, in my company, first of all, we don't do all, all what any Expedia does. We are very small compared to Expedia. In our, in our sector, which is the hotel mainly for you travel, so that's what I compared with Expedia before, and I mentioned that Expedia and any Expedia, of course they do resorts, but they specialize in cities. <coughs> and they are not strong in resorts yet, so we have an edge, if you want, in my opinion, against those OTAs. I cannot compare you travel with Expedia, for example, in the flight element, because you travel is, so it doesn't exist on that, or we use flights only for our dynamic packaging and no more than that. All right. uh, the second question, what, who's your major competitor in the UK? It's the company I created eight years ago, methotels.com. But it doesn't exist now. It's the number one in the, in, the co in, in the industry. You have to declare that Adonis is working with Hotels for You. Was. Hotels for You bought Met Hotels together with Thomas Cook. Yes, okay. If, if you prefer to call it Hotels for You. Uh, I don't prefer, I'm not working with them anymore. No, no, okay. that's fine. So Hotels for You uh, <laughs> slash Met Hotels is, is, uh, is my number one competitor and not only my number one competitor. So has the biggest share in the market. And why? By far. Uh, sorry? And why? Why? Because Met Hotels was the very first one. Yeah, yeah but they were losing money in last minute. Sorry? They were losing money in lastminute.com. They were not making money. Not Met Hotels, last minute was losing money. Yeah, but the name That's was a big Met difference. Hotels. Sorry? The name was Met Hotels of the company. No. So they were losing money. That's why they've been bought for a uh, cheap first price. First of all, I cannot company. mention numbers for last minute because last minute, you know, it was a listed company, etc. But just to give you an example from what I know and what I can say out of that, Met Hotels was the only or one of the two companies of lastminute.com which they were extremely profitable. The most profitable one was Met Hotels out of 14 acquisitions in the travel industry in Europe. Uh, I cannot comment on last minute results at the time, but I can comment on Met Hotels results because I was running Met Hotels during my days in last minute. Uh, now to your specific question, why he Hotels for You and, and Met Hotels together combined is the number one in UK is Met Hotels, the oldest one. Hotels for you, it was the first copy paste of Met Hotels in 2004. Of course, they have six years behind them and they had a big growth on that. So both of them, they've been bought by Thomas Cook. 
traditional player, but with good funding, with good, uh, if you want, uh, so distribution, etc. And that's why, so they have the biggest share of the market right now. We are the biggest independent ourselves in UK. Who are the tour operators that you are feeding, Joel, can you say? No. Okay. Ex so you say tour operators, yes? Yeah. Which tour operators are buying from uh, you, you, you travel? Uh, various, but don't think the big ones, you know, don't think the... They used to, so the early days of Met Hotels, even big tour operators, they used to buy from, uh, from Met Hotels. Not anymore. Of course, they have their own model, their own companies, etc. But we feed online tour operators. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm just going to come back to the point that was raised earlier by uh, the gentleman talking about North Cyprus, but also looking at Graham Richardson, who's been in my <laughs> eyesight. Uh, Graham is the Director of Tourism for the Borough of Paul. Um, what sort of relationship do you have with destination marketing organisations in building the sort of overall popularity of the destination, rather than just the resort? None. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> Sorry, none. Any reason why? Uh, first of all, are you talking as, uh, uh, as you travel.com now or um, as an operator you are asking me? As, or an, op as an operator. Because we, we have, I believe as an operator, what can we get from, uh, only if we go to a new destination, mm. if it is exists, for example, uh, to be honest, I believe one of the, of, the, uh, of the big destinations will come in the next four or five years it's going to be one of the best ones in the Mediterranean, which is, is Libya. Yeah. 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 Uh, I believe it's the, it's the next big one, it's the next Egypt. Uh, and has amazing, uh, so beaches, etc. But if you have something like that, the example I gave with Libya, why? If, if, if you have, if you target something, definitely you need. But we are not. Uh, if you want a, a, a big player like so Tui or Thomas Cook, which will need uh, so something like that. We work in a very simple way with the hotels and we have a huddling agent in resort for to cover all our uh, problems and complaints and, uh, and transfers and whatever. And we, we never used. Right. Just a final question really, where do you see the future of your businesses? No, is it geographical expansion into the likes of sort of Benghazi, Sumer, maybe? Or My business? Are you, yeah. D do you see growth into different sectors? Yes. So in Aquis, we will try to grow in outside Greece, if you want, which we are not right now. We are only in Greece. Uh, we had, a, if you want, a gap. We haven't acquired any hotel for the last 12 months. Uh, yes, we had to breathe, you know. It was too fast what we did. Um, and the new travel is outside UK, but what I always say when I start a business, and Dimitri forgot to ask me, mm. in <laughs> when he <laughs> is, uh, and I remember when uh, I give you the example of new travel, when we announced new travel, was the 28th of October 2006, Saturday. Uh, and a uh, few days before the launch, uh, I, had, uh, I had a journalist on the phone from a, a travel, uh, so a travel paper in UK. I think, what are you gonna do, John? Are you gonna sell the business like the previous one? And I said to him, yes. And you know, and and I always say that, and I believe that when you start a business, and many people they don't do that, irrelevant what business it is and what industry, if it is a small business or will become a big business, etc. The first thing, in my opinion, not the first one of the first thing you have to have on your business plan is the exit strategy. If you don't have exit strategy. Uh, and uh, time scale, irrelevant if you catch it or not, if it is five years, seven years, w whatever is that, I think uh, you don't have a business plan. So I believe for any entrepreneur and for any business, the aim should be an exit. There are various ways for an exit. It can be an IPO, it can be a trade sale, it can be a, uh, a, a fund to invest and to get a share in your business, they are but you have to have an exit strategy. And so the future of Aquis and new travel is to grow them more. But as I always say, if the opportunity comes at any time, even tonight, <laughs> um, you know, so I'm always open. I'm always open to to listen. Uh, so, oh, no, 
If that's an honest <laughs> answer, you know, it's, you know, it's m many people, they don't, they try not to, if you want to, so they deny, no, we are not for sale. We are not for sale. We are not in the market. Mm. But, so never say, you know, we're not, it can happen any time. But right now we are in the growth. Uh, also. Just, just a sort of long-term looking ahead, Mark. Some recent UNWTO reports are suggesting that future tourism to the Mediterranean may well sort of peak in May and September time because the peak season months of July and August will become, with climate changes, too hot, even for the UK market. Uh, any evidence of that happening from your experience to date? More bookings on the, on the, on the sort of... Uh, edge of the season and a little less in the July and August time. First of all, I didn't know about that, about what you mentioned just now and about this research, but uh, maybe this is a good thing <laughs> for the hoteliers, uh, because the problem of a hotelier, I, I don't know the answer to be honest, on, on, on you. I don't have an answer, but the problem of any hotelier in the Mediterranean, any, in any destination, except if it is something very unique, there are some hotels very unique, they are full all year round, or if they operate six, seven months, they are full all the time. For any standard hotel, the problem always is the edges. So the start at the end of the season. Uh, and something I always say to, to my people and to, to my marketing sales, etc. I say, any hotelier can fill a hotel between June and September, four months. <laughs> any. It's easy. If you are in a, in a good resort, it's very easy to do that. Where you will count to a good hotelier and to get a good GOP at the end of the year is to fill the edges with the right price. Uh, so if that happens, it might help so the yield of the, of the hotel chain. Uh, but I didn't know about that. That's a very interesting information. Do you have a question? Sorry, I'm right now. I'm hospitality and tourism questions. Um, do you always talk about your vision when you read your blog? Looking back five, ten years' time in your vision, do you see any place for maybe a Greek football team winning the Champions League? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who in the house? Olympiacos. Huh? Olympiacos. Yeah, okay. Maybe in the next three years, not ten. Three years. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. You make some people very happy in the audience. Um, there is a Japanese uh, tsunami uh, box that goes around to collect some money. Who has got it? Okay, I'll collect that and uh, I'll have it back. Several people in the, from the audience on the Twitter has actually asked questions and I'll go up to John Fotis uh, who has been collecting them up there. So we've got five or six questions uh, and, and we'll go through that. Hmm? I don't. But because he, do it very, he does very well with having a chairman. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Justin Reed from uh, Visit Britain is asking you about transactions on Facebook. Uh, do you think them as a waste of time? Transactions. Uh, transactions, sales transactions on Facebook. I mean, there are companies who are uh, using Facebook yeah, 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 to yeah. have the reservations uh, pages. Um, a waste of time, and therefore, should we stick to only inspiring people through Facebook, or do you see that there is a trend towards that direction? I That's think it's a trend. Depends how you do your advertising in Facebook. I've seen, I, I've seen some ads which they don't work at all, in my opinion. I don't think they work. And we try ourselves sometimes. And I've seen some others which they work. Now, why some of them they work and why not? I'm not the expert to... Um, Chucky, UK, um, what can we expect in terms of the next major e-tourism development? Uh, will we be taking virtual holidays in future? Sorry, so the last one? Will we be taking virtual holidays in the future? Virtual holidays. Virtual. I don't know. Sorry. Okay. But Sorry what do you I think? What What do you think as the next big e-tourism development? Can you foresee something? I mentioned in the very early, of, of, of <laughs> I said that I believe in the next seven eight years you will all the intermediaries will be out and you will have hotel chains with uh, dynamic packaging. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, John. Any more questions from the audience? I'm trying to kind of bring it towards the end. Hi, John. Hello. My name is Christina. Thank you. Thank you. What keeps you going, and what is your personal aspirations for the for the future? 
I don't know what's keeping me going, but if I stop, I will die. <laughs> and something for my dean, John. How often do you travel? Because my dean thinks that I'm traveling too much. <laughs> I travel every week, every week. Uh, hmm? <laughs> I know, that's a small difference. Uh, every week, Dimitris. In, 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 in various destinations, but mainly to do destinations, but uh, between Athens and London, mainly. But every week. If I don't travel one week, something is wrong. Okay. Um, last question. Last question? No, you will ask me the best question last as three? well. Oh my God. Just remember the best question. <laughs> one to end with. If you weren't in the travel industry, what could you see yourself doing? Sorry, my friend. If you weren't in the travel industry, what could you see yourself doing as an alternative career? Uh, Psychologist, maybe? I never thought about that. Let me... What did you want to be when you were a little boy, then? You would laugh now if I tell you, but I will. A footballer? A general. General Kent, thank you very much. <laughs> in actual fact, you are a general in a very, uh, very well-orchestrated business. Um, thank you, John. Thank you very, very much for thank you very much, all sir. your honest, uh, honest uh, and visionary <laughs> answers. <laughs> Colleagues, before I hand over to Keith, uh, to my dean, Dr. Keith Wilkes, to say thank you to John, and before John thinks of the best question, I have to think. Okay, I about uh, I'll give you two minutes because I'm gonna say that entry to this event was free, exit is not. Uh, where our Japanese friends here are collecting some money for the Japanese tsunami appeal, and they'll be sitting by the door. If you can spare some money, it will be appreciated, please. Um, and my friend here is uh, Huka is gonna be there uh, collecting a little bit of money. Yeah, on your way out, just be generous. John, enough time to think of an interesting question? I hope so. Which one? No, I don't know yet. Give me, give me, give me. Give me two, three. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to say Sorry. what thanks? All right, okay. Right, thank you very much, John. Uh, I think uh, on behalf of the school, uh, we'd like to thank you for all your support in the past and also for this evening's very entertaining and amusing discussion, question and answer session and look forward to receiving you again in the future. I think a couple of things I'd like to point out in a sense. I think we almost got away without mentioning Olympiakos, but almost in the end. In fact, they just won the Greek League, is that right, John? And, you, and you're very, very pleased. So they might win the Champions League in the future, is that right? We will be this year, actually, so already we are qualified. Right. I think while John's busy trying to think about the, the best question, and hopefully this lot won't win it, but never mind, um, I think he gave the best answer to all of us in a sense when he was giving advice for future careers basically worked really hard for 15 years with no holidays, but that, that's probably not the encouragement some of the audience wanted. So on that note, I think... The industry is going to go for love. Yeah, exactly. So on that note, I'd like to uh, offer my thanks again, and perhaps another round of applause was a... Sorry. So thank you very much, John. <laughs> and one, one final comment, just to add to Dimitros's comment about tsunami appeal. You may not have enough money to buy a hotel, but you've got plenty of money to make a very good call. So money in the box when you leave. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.